Three weeks into heightened alert, Singapore's health minister notes that the country is heading in the right direction. That as five new local cases reported today. MOE's first dedicated vaccination centre is up and running as part of a national drive to vaccinate over 400,000 students. And local researchers develop a new blood test that can tell if cancer treatment is successful in the first 24 hours. You're watching The Big Story live from the Straits Times newsroom. I'm Harianto Diman. Now you can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. For the second straight day, Singapore reported a new local COVID-19 cases in single digits. There were five new infections in the community today, all linked to previous cases and already in quarantine. Today's count is also the lowest since May 10th. Nine imported cases were also confirmed, with five being Singaporeans or PRs. Now more details will be released tonight. The first vaccination centre set up just for students to get their shots opened this morning. ITE College Central is the first of four dedicated MOE vaccination centres that is now up and running. The next three will be progressively opened in the coming days. The first batch of eligible students includes those who are part of the graduating cohort from secondary schools and pre-university levels. So far, almost 9 in 10 from graduating cohorts have signed up and half of them have received their first jabs. And according to Education Minister Chan Chun Singh, from tomorrow, students in autonomous universities will begin receiving invitations to get vaccinated. As we begin a new week, there's one question on everybody's minds right now. Will restrictions ease when the heightened alert period ends on Sunday, June the 13th? Well, sounding quite positive, Health Minister Ong Yi Kang says that things are heading in the right direction. In a handwritten note he shared on social media yesterday that covers the last three weeks, Mr Ong pointed to three key indicators the number of those quarantined before detection, not quarantined but linked to clusters, and unlinked cases. According to Mr Ong, the percentage of infected people who were detected while under quarantine has gone up from 57 to 73%, which means there's less chance for them to spread the virus to others. Now, more encouraging, he said, is that the unlinked cases have fallen from 18 to 15%. And as you can see, the number of total cases have also been dropping. Separately, in an update on the mass testing exercise in Hogang last night, more than 3,700 people who lived or visited HHDB blocks in the vicinity have tested negative for COVID-19. With some results still pending, just one person has so far tested positive during the swab tests. For a closer look, I'm joined by Professor Dale Fisher, infectious diseases expert from the Yong Lulin School of Medicine at NUS. Now, Professor also chairs the National Infection Prevention and Control Committee. Welcome back, Professor. COVID-19 figures in the past few days seem to indicate that we are heading in the right direction. Now, today's number is also in its single digit of five. Now, we've also seen mass testing exercises being carried out to catch possible hidden cases. So based on all this, uh, Prof, how are things looking for Singapore as we head towards June 13th? Thanks for having me back, Harianto. Uh, yes, we can see things are obviously uh, on a good path. Uh, I'm not convinced that we're going to see major changes on, on June 13th, just because what we're doing is actually working. You see, the, the problem is we've got this very inf infectious strain, this Delta strain or, or B1617. And uh, not only is that more transmissible, but, but we're, we're seeing it circulate in a, in a setting where 30 or 40% of Singapore is vaccinated. And we know that vaccination causes more disease to be asymptomatic. So this is a good thing, of course, but obviously... Uh, when you're trying to, to track the virus, you're going to get more asymptomatic people or, as you describe, more, more hidden cases. So, so this is why we need to, if you like, dig out the, the circulating virus by doing these mass testing campaigns. But, uh, but you know, the, the numbers speak for themselves and with, uh, with all the testing that's being done and all the efforts being done by, 
by people that live in the country, are, they're all, uh, we're, we're seeing everything come together quite nicely. But, but June 13, do I expect the, the ministry to undo a lot of things? Um, there may be some tweaks, but uh, they're certainly always looking to balance the, the health threats against the economic and social impact of the interventions. So, so maybe in that respect, there might be some tweaks because things are going well, but uh, there's serious light at the end of the tunnel now with, with the pandemic uh, you know, being over uh, potentially. Um, so, so I don't think they want to spoil things as we're sort of moving into that phase. Right, Professor, I just want to touch on the mass testing exercises uh, that uh, you know, we were talking about earlier on as well. Thousands were tested over the past weekend, uh, especially in the context of the Hogang um, situation. What do you make of these um, mass testing exercises you know, moving forward in Singapore's uh, strategy to maintain or to uh, manage uh, the pandemic? Is it worrying that you know, we're heading towards the, that direction, concerning even? Well, all these um, sort of non-pharmaceutical interventions, the, the NPIs, we call them, they're, they're really the backbone of our um, efforts. Uh, but but they're, they're really, they don't seem to be enough just to do symptomatic people and contacts because uh, as anyone that's been following the numbers over the last few weeks will we'll see that there's just so frequently um, cases that, that at least at the start aren't linked. So if you've got unlinked cases, then you need to, uh, and you really do want to keep control, which we do at this stage, then, then obviously this mass testing is important. So, uh, so, so I think it's a good um, thorough strategy because this pandemic isn't over. It will be over, but, but it's not yet. And we have to just keep going with this sort of, um, you know, aggressive tactics, if you like, uh, until we get up to that very high vaccination rate that we're after. So aggressive ramped up efforts in testing. Now we are in a different situation compared with a post-circuit breaker last year. On top of ramped up efforts in testing, we are better equipped to trace. And not to forget as well, people are getting vaccinated. So what sort of reopening are we likely to see, Professor? A gradual one or a more targeted approach? So this, is, this phase is new territory, obviously. We haven't uh, come out of the pandemic. We're seeing some countries uh, talk about it. Uh, Israel and UK with vaccination rates around 60%. So there does get to a point where cases don't matter so much. We used to know that cases meant more cases, meant more cases and it would exponentially grow. Hospitals would get overwhelmed. Um, excess people, excess deaths would be, would be realized. But eventually when we're vaccinated well enough, a case won't mean that. A case will mean a cold where you may not even get tested and you might just stay home to recover. That, that's where we're going to end up. But this phase of where we are now through to that point, which will probably take most of the rest of this year, I think, uh, I, I think we still need to navigate. We still need to, to work out how we can loosen the screws without leaving behind the people that still aren't vaccinated. All right. Well, great points there, Professor. Thank you for your insights. I've been speaking to infectious disease expert from the NUS's Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, Professor Dale Fisher. In other COVID-19 news, the Health Ministry has debunked a widely circulated WhatsApp message claiming that COVID-19 treatment protocols here have changed. The message makes the false claim that following an autopsy, the authorities here discovered that COVID-19 is a bacterium that has been exposed to radiation and causes human death by coagulation in the blood. According to the message, MOH immediately changed the treatment protocol for patients here, giving them aspirin instead, which is another false claim. Now looking overseas, China is scaling up its domestic production of COVID-19 vaccines to further increase foreign supply, especially to developing countries. So far, the country has provided more than 350 million vaccine doses overseas. 
Two domestic, two domestic vaccines developed separately by Sinopharm and Sinovac Biotech recently gained emergency use approval by the World Health Organization. The approval allows the two vaccines to be included in the major global vaccine sharing platform COVAX. Australia's Victoria State today reported 11 new local cases, its biggest daily rise in nearly a week. All were linked to existing clusters. This comes as residents of its capital, Melbourne, wait to hear if an extended snap lockdown will end as planned on Thursday night. Melbourne entered its 11th day of a hard lockdown today after officials on the previous Friday found the more infectious variant for the first time among the cases. Meanwhile, Taiwan will extend its COVID-19 restrictions for another two weeks until June the 28th and schools will remain shut until the summer vacation. The island has been dealing with a spike in domestic infections and is in the second highest alert level with gatherings restricted, entertainment venues shut and students shifted to online learning. Premier Su Seng Chan said that Taiwan will start to distribute 1.24 million AstraZeneca vaccines donated by Japan this week. In other headlines, local researchers have developed a new blood test called Exoscope, which will allow doctors to tell within a day whether a patient's cancer treatment is working. The team from the National University of Singapore conducted a trial on lung cancer patients and compared to tumour imaging, which is currently deemed to be the gold standard for determining treatment effectiveness, Exoscope achieved an accuracy rate of 95% when conducted within 24 hours after the start of treatment. This is a much quicker result than having to rely on the MRI and CT scans, which are usually done weeks after the treatment. Cleaners will see their wages go up each year over six years after proposals put forth by a tripartite committee on the cleaning wage ladder were accepted by the government today. From 2023 to 2028, the base wages of Singaporean and PR cleaners across all job levels will see a year-on-year -year increase. About 40,000 cleaners across some 1,500 cleaning business here is set to benefit from this adjustment. By early next year, commuters will be able to use just one mobile application to book taxi, private bus, car rental and leasing services from the Comfort Del Grow Group. It said today that the planned Mega app will make it easier for its customers to access its various services. Other offerings such as restaurant bookings, learning driving services and medical transport will also be available in the app. The lives of Instagram influencers might seem exciting and glamorous and an easy way to make a living. So, can anyone become an influencer in 30 days? Well, Straits Times journalist Jen Lee has been finding out. Instagrammers, famous, beautiful, influential. But what does it take to succeed? And how much of what we see on Instagram is fake? It is day 30. I have fake smiled my way through this, slept on filters, and spent about US $70 buying fake followers, comments, and likes. I now have about 5,200 followers, which means that I'm officially a micro-influencer. But advertisers aren't exactly sliding to my DMs all that much. Jen joins me now to share more. Now Jen, part of the investigative piece is about you trying to become an influencer in 30 days. In doing so, what are the greatest misconceptions that people have about influencers? Oh, I think I learned a lot. I think the greatest misconception is that it's easy or that, you know, people who do this thing is, oh, they're just pretty, they don't have any skills, uh, they just look good and uh, it's, you know, they're lazy, like they don't want to find a real job, you know, which is really, really wrong because in trying to become an influencer, which I 
did not really uh, succeed at doing. Um, it's really not easy. It does take a lot of time out of your out of your out of your life, lah, right? Um, especially a lot of the influencers we speak to don't actually do this full time. So you know, on top of their day jobs, they are taking weekends out to do photo shoots, and you have to be very committed at consistently providing photos. Uh, consistently putting things out onto your feed in order to maintain a um, in order to maintain an audience you see so it's really not that easy and you have to learn to edit your photographs so that you know the aesthetic is consistent in the feed because you know if the color composition between from photo to photo is very different it just looks very amateur so a lot of them you know have basic Photoshop skills. Um, for example, you look at Xia Xue's feet, it's very pastel looking because that's her aesthetic and that's what she wants to do. And, you know, you have to be constantly like, okay, now I'm going to do a story and share about my life, share about this amazing thing that I just ate. It takes effort because taking a story is effort. Like you have to take a story, tell people, explain things, you know. So you also have to be very good on camera because you have to be very willing to speak um, to the camera, be very willing to explain things about your life, be very good with words. You know, you introduce things like, oh, you know, I use this product and it's great, but you can't just say it's great. You have to explain why it's great, right? So there's like a lot of things involved in it. And I would say that it's definitely not easy and it's definitely not, um, you know, just just superficial and just like taking a photo you upload and you're done there's a lot of work that goes into it and you have to think about what image you want to craft uh, and you know what sort of persona you want to you want to portray on social media that's it jen for anyone who follows influencers on social media platforms what should they be aware of before buying into that lifestyle so to speak well, I think nowadays consumers and audiences are quite savvy. So at least personally, you know, when I scroll through social media, I can kind of tell when something is an ad, when something is sponsored, when something is a free gift and so on. So I'm not too worried about that. I think if you're social media savvy, if you grew up with the internet, it comes quite naturally to you. I think, um, I think what people have to realize is that, you know, if you want to become an influencer, if you think like that lifestyle seems amazing, it's not as simple as just, you know, taking pictures and uploading it. People give you free things. People give you products to try because they believe you have value to their brand and you have to create that value for yourself. So the creation of that value is actually difficult and it's not that easy. So it's not as easy as, um, as people think it is to gain that sort of lifestyle that an influencer has. And also I think, you know, young people especially need to be aware that it's not exactly the most realistic to expect that your life will look as perfect as an Instagrammer's feed because, well, their lives are not as perfect as their feed, you know, that feed is curated for an audience, that feed is curated to market themselves. So, of course, it would be polished and, of course, it will look amazing, you know. So, don't, um, I think, have overly unrealistic expectations of how your own life should be like, should be like, you shouldn't be like oh why don't I look so good at the beach you know why don't I look so good drinking a cocktail you know why don't I have all these parties to go to like you know they have a lifestyle they have a job that uh, necessitates that kind of life and they need to look good in order to sustain uh, that audience and that fan base Thanks, Jen. And that was journalist Jen Lee sharing her experience in trying to become an influencer in 30 days in the latest episode of ST's investigative series, Close Up. You can watch it on our Facebook and YouTube channel. Now, for more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman. See you tomorrow on The Big Story.